Well, good morning, uh, everyone, and welcome to uh, our fall IENR All Hands meeting. I was uh, just doing the quick math. This is uh, the sixth All Hands meeting that I've been a part of, and uh, man, how time flies. Uh, it was a beautiful morning this morning when the sun was coming up, and it's a beautiful blue sky. And I think that is appropriate for um, having a conversation about IENR and all the, the magic that happens in this institution and this institute. Um, we are being joined. Um, I don't think we need the slides up here, but if we've got colleagues across the state who are listening and uh, piping in via live stream, but also, <laughs> that's a really bad picture. <laughs> Maybe we should go back to the INR. And thank you to those who are controlling that, who are giving me the benefit of the doubt. <laughs> Stephen, you have the same problem, all <laughs> right? I'm glad I shaved this morning. Um, what's not falling out, I <laughs> catch with the razor, I guess. But listen, I just want to say thanks. This morning, though, when I walked in, uh, Natural Resources 433 and 833. We are displaced today because of the IENR All Hands meeting. I think I need to uh, send a, a thank you note to the class and the students and where's, where's, uh, where's uh, maybe some warm cookies or something. Uh, that's not what we, we don't wanna be displacing our students, that's for sure. So um, let me give you kind of the update on how we're going to proceed. We have an hour and a half together and we've been trying different formats. Um, we sent out a survey. We liked that format the last time where we asked all of IENR to give us questions. We received some questions and uh, we bundled them up. So the first 30 minutes, we've got different members of the IENR leadership team who's going to actually step up and address your questions that you have. Those questions, however, we will take and, and provide written usually more detailed information and we'll post those on the IENR website at the All Hands website so that you can go and read more uh, inquiring minds want to know about some of those details so they'll be there and we did that the last All Hands. The middle 30 minutes give or take it, we've asked uh, Jenny Kashwani and uh, Rich Bischoff really Jenny Kashwani from the IANR faculty liaison committee this is the one standing committee in the entire institute, and uh, Jenny's going to talk about their journey on um, thinking about and moving forward uh, with a vote of the faculty related to an INR promotion and tenure committee that would be analogous to a college level committee, say in CEHS. And I won't, I won't get in the way uh, of that, but the vote is coming and uh, the, the liaison committee would like some time in front of the, the group and we thought this was a, a, a good venue. And then the last 30 minutes, give or take, I would like to share with you some observations, some input and then uh, burning questions from the audience. And then uh, here in Lincoln, uh, Premier Catering has been gracious both last year and this year to actually uh, feed us. So we have a IENR picnic here uh, in Lincoln and so without further ado, I think uh, the rule of engagement is that Haley is controlling the remote and I think Tiffany is the first question, question on the table. Hey, Sherry. Well, good morning. Is this on? Oh, perfect. Okay, so one of the questions that we received was on the college's Smart Enrollment Growth Initiative. Um, so I want to take this opportunity to share with you a bit of background on how we got started with this initiative and where we are today. So we launched this initiative 18 months ago. Um, our approach to smart enrollment growth is holistic, and it's not driven by a single factor, but rather a combination of factors, including recruiting new students to our college college, the retention of our current students, taking into consideration the number of students that will be graduating each academic year, as well as matriculation success. So it's a holistic approach from that standpoint. It's also a partner-driven ship model. The process started with our 
academic degree programs and units, establishing their directional goals, followed by the college, which is different from the traditional approach, but many times it's top down in how we drive these enrollment goals. The enrollment goals that the units developed in the college um, were informed by data analytics. So we partnered with Jen Moeller and INR Data Analytics to develop a series of dashboards um, that include the data analytics at the degree program level as well as the college. Um, and then this was paired with an external market analysis that allowed us to be able to look at our recruitment potential over the next five years, provide feedback on our preliminary directional goals at the degree program level in the college. College. First of all, are we too aggressive or have we not stretched ourselves enough? And then finally, looking at employment opportunities as we look forward um, for our students that are graduating from our programs. At the same time, strategic discussions have been taking place at the unit level around the priorities across our three mission areas and alignment of resources um, to drive those initiatives. And then finally, the college team has been meeting with our academic programs to have ongoing um, planning sessions around these smart enrollment growth initiatives. Our goal is to leverage our competitive advantages and strengths um, to recruit, enroll, retain, and graduate an academically diverse and talented community of learners that will align with the changing demographics of our state as well as the need for a diverse workforce. I want to emphasize that we're not chasing numbers with our approach. Rather, we are focused on being the best in the areas of our strength and focusing on student success. The work that we've done to date is going to position the Institute to be ahead of the curve um, as we adopt a new budget model going into fiscal year 21. To conclude, um, I think I got a few seconds left, right, Haley? Um, I want to leave you with a bit of good news. So we kicked off the start of this academic year with a combined enrollment total of 3,222 students, which is the largest enrollment in the history of the college. And this was driven by a 2% increase in undergraduate enrollment. I can't emphasize enough how significant this is. The university was down in enrollment. Our peer institutions of ag and natural resources have been experiencing declining enrollments over the past two to three years. We graduated our largest graduating class in the history of the college last academic year, which was 105 more students than the previous year. And if that's not enough, you combine this with a 4% increase in undergraduate enrollment last academic year. So to be up in enrollment is a major accomplishment and something that we should celebrate is. Bottom line is, none of that would be possible if it weren't for an amazing INR community that is committed to our students and their success in advancing our teaching and learning missions. So I want to thank you for all that you do each and every day um, for our students in the college. Thanks. The next question is about the NCTA Dean Search Timeline. Um, so the Nebraska College of Technical Agriculture um, reports um, to the Vice President of the University of Nebraska system, not to the Vice Chancellor, and those two people are the same person. Um, so <laughs> that, uh, that search is being run out of, out, of Mike's, out of Mike's office. Ron Rosati, who was uh, the dean for five plus years, um, he stepped down as dean. Um, Kelly Bruns, who is the director of West Central Research and Extension Center, is currently serving as the interim dean. Tiffany Hang Moss is going to be the, the chair of the search committee. We're hoping to be able to have somebody in place um, as a permanent dean in July, by July 1st of 2020. Um, hopefully we'll be having um, interviews for that position in February. Um, that means that we'll need to have that search committee in place sometime here in October with a charge given to them no, long, no later than November 1st with advertising and some pretty aggressive um, marketing, contacting people, trying to build up a, a, a deep and diverse candidate pool during November and December. Okay. 
Good morning. The question uh, that I was asked to address has to do with uh, partnerships that we might have with schools surrounding East Campus. So I'm Sherry Jones, Dean of the College of Education and Human Sciences. And of course, my college has very strong partnerships with Lincoln Public Schools. We place uh, over 1,800 students each year in all of Lincoln Public Schools, including those surrounding East Campus for practicum and student teacher experiences. So our students are really well prepared to work with the classrooms of tomorrow. Um, we also have research um, partnerships. We have research projects going on in a variety of the schools around East Campus, evaluating interventions for children with special needs, for um, children to help them um, understand where they are with their own um, health literacy and so forth. So for example, we have a research project with um, Lincoln High Schools, particularly Northeast High School, where we developed a curriculum called Healthy You. So this helps high school students understand where they are in terms of their own health literacy. So those are just a couple examples from CEHS. But CASNR and Extension also have activities going on in the schools surrounding East Campus. Just a few examples for you. So Kasner has a Dean Scholar in Experiential Learning. This is part of the science literacy community where first year students um, serve as pen pals and mentors to fourth graders at Harley Elementary School and help those children understand the role of egg in their lives and where their food comes from and um, elements like that. Extension um, is heavily involved in the schools in terms of after school programs. Um, they provide programming on recycling, they provide programming on nutrition, they provide after school clubs at the local schools. Uh, they also do a variety of things in providing nutrition information. So all Lincoln Public Schools receive um, school enrichment kits around nutrition and Extension helps teachers expand their knowledge um, and capability to teach nutrition to young children. So these are just a few examples of ways that IANR is involved in the local schools. Um, one thing I will say that's important if you are interested in developing partnerships with the schools, it's very important to work with the uh, Lincoln Public Schools District Office so that these activities are co-created to be mutually beneficial. And if you have desire to um, work in the schools in a variety of ways, Tiffany, me, Kathleen Lodel, or Jean Ann Fisher would be happy to work with you to find uh, who to connect with to co-create those kinds of experiences. Thank you. So that question was specifically about uh, engaging the schools around East Campus. And so we didn't talk about the amazing work that happens with our 243 school districts in Nebraska. Um, all across this amazing state, there's great work. We're really focused here. That question was focused on, on Lincoln. So I'm standing in. I have the next two questions uh, standing in for Archie Clutter. On the first question, the question was, are there any updates on the National Institute for antimicrobial resistance research and education um, since it was announced last summer, last July. Um, just a little bit of background for those of you who might not have been with us. Uh, the APLU, the Association of Public and Land Grant Universities, along with the American Association of Veterinary Medical Colleges, the AAVMC, have been talking amongst themselves for, I'd say, a good part of the last six to eight years about the importance of One Health. And of course, we focus on One Health being the health of humans is intimately connected with the health of animals, which is intimately connected with the health of the environment, broadly writ to include plants and the environment, natural resources. And so this group has been talking and last, uh, let's say a year and a half ago, finally an RFP was issued to stand up a national institute that focuses on the issue of antimicrobial resistance. Pull any uh, scientific magazine off the, 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 uh, the shelf. Um, antimicrobial resistance is a big deal. It's a big deal in human health. I think most of us probably know somebody who went to the hospital for a relatively routine procedure and then didn't, uh, came home with some, some infection that was very difficult to control. Uh, we have the same types of issues with uh, animal health 
and the same actually types of issues, different mechanisms when we think about herbicide resistance or fungicide resistance as we think about crop protection and insecticide resistance. I don't want the entomologist to get upset with me. It's a big deal. So we went toe to toe and the point of pride on this was we went toe to toe with Cornell and UC Davis and Minnesota and Wisconsin, um, Georgia, uh, Florida, um, NC State, um, and the one I like, the needle, and I hope we needle them on Saturday, Ohio State. We partnered, knowing that we couldn't do this by ourselves, we partnered with the Med Center to bring in the human medicine, and we partnered with both the Met, uh, Vet College and the uh, Ag College at Iowa State. They partnered with the College of Public Health at Iowa, and then we also partnered with the Mayo Clinic. So five partners, we got the bid, and that was announced a year ago in July. And we have been feverishly, to answer the question, feverish pitch of trying to move the institute forward. The first thing that we did was to create an interim advisory group of some individuals that actually had this idea five, six years ago. Second thing we did is we aligned ourselves with a presidential commission on antimicrobial resistance. It's called PAC-CARB. It's, uh, it's now in its sixth year and they are responsible for reporting to the Office of Science and Technology and the White House on where the nation should be going when it comes to antimicrobial resistance. We have uh, then set up um, a meeting in May where we brought faculty from all of the institutions that were competing for this. I'm happy to report that all but one institution, it happened to be Minnesota, chose not to come to the table. I think they, uh, they, they thought they could do it by themselves and I wish them well, um, but the rest of the institutions all came and we began talking about the strengths of each of our institutions. The other thing that we did, the fourth thing I would say is that for the first time ever in my 34 year higher education career, uh, we were invited by Representative Fortenberry, who's the ranking minority member on the Ag Appropriations, House Ag Appropriations Committee. He invited us to uh, draft some appropriations bill language. Bob Wilhelm and others, uh, we drafted the language. I mean, I'm pleased to say it got incorporated verbatim into the, uh, now the farm bill. And so we are, uh, that has become a central focus of UNL's uh, federal engagement strategy. It's a big deal. Uh, so there's a lot going on behind the scenes. Uh, there's a meeting uh, in October that some of our faculty will be participating in to think about next steps. We have a lot of good work to do yet. The intention here is to generate um, through industry and universities about 20 to 25 million dollars of commitment and then take that to Washington next March through the appropriations process and say, would you match our dollars, federal government, dollar for dollar with the private funds. The target is to actually um, increase funding through the AFRI program for $25 million plus to uh, enhance the research that we do here. As Tiffany said, it's building strength on strength. So that's, that's the question about um, this thing we're calling NIAMRI, another acronym. The second question I have is I'm filling in for Chuck, and I should say that both uh, Dean Hibbard and, and Dean Clutter, once a year, all of the experiment station directors and all of the extension directors and deans get together and they happen to be meeting right now, and so neither could be here. The question was, when will Nebraska's uh, extension engagement zones go into effect? Uh, if you're not in extension or you don't touch extension, there's been a good 14 month long conversation about how can we uh, take something that's already the best in class around the country and step it up to actually even um, be more connected. That's the word I would use. More connected to the people of the state of Nebraska. And so if you uh, know about extension, we have ourselves organized into five districts. Uh, from the Panhandle to West Central to the Eastern, and then the Eastern is subdivided into three districts, so Southeast, Northeast, and the Metro. We will be moving from that model to a model where we will have 11 what we're calling engagement zones. 11 engagement zones. Each engagement zone will have somebody called, not very 
not very uh, creative there, an engagement zone coordinator. And the engagement zones coordinator, their, their job, one of their big jobs is to be a relationship manager, to know the leaders in the school districts, to know the members of the unicam role, the county commissioners, the clergy, to really understand what's going on in that zone. And behind me is the map, the proposed map of what these engagement zones look like. There was a lot of work that went into this. The other thing which is, uh, which is a big change is the uncoupling, the uncoupling of the reporting lines of the forward deployed faculty that we have that are currently reporting by and large to one of five individuals. We have some uh, people who are, are supervising uh, up to 50, 55, 60 people. Every book I've ever read about on effective management says no more than eight direct reports. So we have a system in place that not only are we going to think about connections with our communities, but we need to think about enhancing and doubling down the connections with our faculty, our people, because that's, that's what I say it all the time, we win with our people. So January 1st is the answer to the question. We're in the midst right now of uh, interviewing the individuals that will become our engagement zone coordinators. We hope to have them hired by November 1 and then work with them for 60 days to develop a, a team, a sense of team, and then we will roll this out on January 1. Lots of internal dialogue, lots of conversation, so that's where we're at on the timeline. My question is, how many faculty positions will likely be released in the coming year? I like the word likely there. <laughs> well, let me start my answer by going back to 2011. We put in place a process that replaced, which I will call euphemistically the black box process that existed prior to that, which was a process that didn't really have a process. As a department head, we never really knew quite how that worked. So in 2011, we put in place a planning process that began in the units where the faculty members and the department heads would have a discussion. And this came after we had established six priority areas within the institute. And we ask the faculty and the department heads to discuss what positions might fill gaps, might leverage the personnel we already have on board. Since then, we've had, we're now in our fourth cycle, uh, approximately two years to each cycle. Phase three is wrapping up and there are 16 current searches that are still ongoing from the previous phase, phase three. And those hires are usually ongoing while we're working on the planning for the next phase, which is phase four. The department heads have done yeoman work on this. Uh, they presented a number of months ago a list of about 60 positions, which we suggested that might be a little bit too enthusiastic for the resources that we have available. So they have now presented us with a list of about 30 positions. From that list, we will, and this is the answer to your question, we will likely release somewhere between 15 and 20 positions in a year. And I'm looking at Jeff here because uh, we always make Jeff nervous when we mention numbers that are too big for the, the fis fiscal uh, resources that we have available. I, I want to stress that this is a thoughtful process where faculty can have input to the department heads. The department heads then, as communities of practice, talk about the faculty at large across the institute. And we recognize that occasionally there might be in each department, or in some of our departments, a position that we call a core position, that is, a faculty position that really just does not 
fit into any of our six communities. And I use the example as if we were a modern languages department, it'd be pretty hard for a German professor to, to teach Portuguese. So there are occasionally positions like that. But I've gone back and looked at the history and we seldom have released more than a third, actually usually less than a third of those core positions that have been requested because we think there are opportunities to meet those needs in the larger context of the I and R faculty. Thank you. I have two questions back to back. Um, did I miss an update of the hiring of the ombudsperson? The short answer is no, you didn't. Um, we do have two ombudspersons who have been identified, though. They've been um, hired by the um, uh, INR Vice Chancellor and also the EVC. Um, Marjorie Kostelnik from Child, Youth, and Family Studies will be serving as an ombuds, as well as um, Rodrigo Franco Cruz from the School of Veterinary Medicine and Biomedical Sciences. Um, Marjorie will be, uh, will have an office on city campus and Rodrigo will have an office on east campus. They're spending time this semester um, getting trained and um, also developing a website, making sure that materials are in place so that we can start well um, with the Ombuds offices um, the first of the year, the first of 2020. Um, the second question is what is being done to facilitate more advancement opportunities for staff? It was about a couple of months ago that um, we put together a, an exploratory committee, a committee that's exploring um, the possibility of having an INR staff council. Um, CEHS, other colleges have had success with their staff councils and doing something like that to support staff development, um, to provide some professional development, you know, opportunities for staff. You know, it seems like a good idea, you know, with the Institute. So we've met three times is what we've done and we've looked at uh, um, these staff councils that exist uh, across the university and also at other places and right now they're working on a mission statement and some purposes. Um, there will be some open forums and some other sorts of things that will be associated with that as we're rolling that out. Well, good morning. I'm here to answer a couple of questions that came in related to operations uh, this morning. Uh, the first question asked uh, us to comment on plans to combine HR, finance, and IT positions and when that would be effective. Um, that relates, I'm sure, to a, an initiative across all of UNL called the Service Delivery Initiative. Um, that is a collaborative process between INR, the EVC office, and the business and finance office downtown, and that's not insignificant. This is the first time in my 18 years here at UNL, all three of those offices have sat down together to try to find ways to make business support more efficient, more effective for all of you. So we have all the right people in the room to have an impact, to improve things. Um, and the philosophy behind that is that we're gonna build a more consistent, structure across all of UNL that provides a, a higher level of service to our administrators, our faculty, and our staff. The nice thing about that is the model, both philosophically and structurally, is built exactly on the model we already have here at INR. Um, you're probably all aware we have business centers out here, and the model that's under development for the rest of campus, is they're calling it service centers, but it's basically business centers as we know those. And so it's very comfortable um, model for us and the transition that we will experience will actually be very minimal. Um, one of the things we were already moving toward before this initiative started was having our current business centers start to form partnerships and work together as larger teams because that would give them a little more depth uh, in, in both people and knowledge base and when we do have turnover that makes it easier to cover duties while we're refilling positions. So we were already moving in the direction that this initiative will take the rest of campus and so you will not see any additional um, consolidation of HR or financial or IT folks within INR, but you will hear and hear about it and see it across the rest of campus, I'm sure. And so I, along with many of my colleagues in our structure, are working with our, our colleagues downtown to, to put that structure in place, provide advice, um, answer questions, uh, be available to help as that transition occurs. 
Uh, the second question that was, was sent in was related to the budget and particularly the RCM model and how resources will flow to the units in the new model. So just to give everybody a little bit of context, we have historically operated in what's called an incremental budget model, which basically means we, every unit has the same budget they had the prior year, plus or minus some increment based upon changes in resources that are flowing to UNL. Um, starting next July 1, UNL will be moving to uh, a revenue-centered model, or an RCM model, uh, where all resources will be pushed out to the major units at UNL, and then expenditures to fund the infrastructure of the operation will be billed out to those units as well. So the model will be very different in that it's going to encourage creativity, entrepreneurship, and we are all going to need to work together to figure out how to direct those revenues to the priorities within the institute. Um, so it, it's just, it's a very different look at the model. It will, in, it will involve all of our resources within the institute. So straight appropriated resources um, will be allocated based upon performance for metrics, um, research related metrics, um, enrollment, graduation related metrics. Our revolving and auxiliary resources will still flow to us. One interesting change, our F&A will flow entirely to us to start, rather than getting what's left after other things have been funded. But then, like I said, behind that, we will be allocated a proportional share of all of the institutional costs to fund operations. So getting back to the specific question about how resources will flow to the units, that's something we're still going to work out together. That's going to be a collaborative process. Um, right now, we have modeled fiscal year 18. We're next working on 19, and then we'll need to do 20, and all that needs to happen before we roll into the model to start FY21. So there are still, honestly, more questions than there are answers at this point, but I'm very comfortable, very confident with the team we have and the leadership we have and all of your collaboration. As we move into that, it will be a model that will work very effectively for INR. So the next question is about the uh, a data breach that happened here in IANR, happened at UNL, but the center of the breach was within IANR. Uh, it happened earlier this summer. Um, the, the basic facts of the matter were that we had, a, we had a staff member here at the university in IANR who had a laptop that was a university laptop assigned to this uh, individual. Um, this individual was working on um, some HR functionality. That was this person's job and uh, had sensitive information uh, on the laptop. Now, um, some of this was known sensitive information and some of it, uh, just to be fair, uh, when this individual got a new laptop, the image of the old laptop simply was dumped onto the new laptop, all of the files without any attention to did the files contain uh, sensitive information. And by that I mean things like social security numbers, so forth and so on. This individual had a lapse in judgment and took the laptop uh, abroad to Italy, uh, was checking into a hotel, left the laptop in the car for five minutes with the rest of the luggage and somebody walked off with the luggage, including the backpack that had the laptop. And so immediately turned it into the Rome police, immediately turned it into uh, UNL, to the central office, which then began uh, a cascade of reactions that uh, first and foremost, what was on the laptop, what could we tell, um, was the data compromised, and how did we get out and reach out to individuals that could have data compromised to uh, secure their data. And that all happened at a very fast clip. Um, Hank Bounds was personally involved. Ronnie Green was personally involved. Mark Askren at the time was personally involved. I got pulled into kind of after the fact a bit, um, but I was aware. And one of the, one of, so that was, the, that was what happened. Uh, unfortunately, best laid intentions, um, all kinds of other things happened along the way. And I think it was uh, an individual who's got a letter on a Saturday postmarked from Madison, Wisconsin in a plain white envelope using their formal legal name. 
And inside was a photo, uh, a, a mimeograph, it looked like an old mimeograph machine, a copy of a letter that sounded really legalese that had I in our letterhead and my signature at the bottom of the letter saying you were compromised. The email was, is this real? And uh, in the next 24 hours, probably another 24 to 25 people, is this real? And uh, so never in my wildest dreams, this was a third party legal group that deals with these issues, never in my wildest dreams would I set, had thought when they wanted to use the letterhead and my signature, I did at least get to see the letter that they would not send it from a postmark in Lincoln in an envelope that said IANR. So it really created quite the firestorm. In that letter, it said that uh, there's no reason for us to suspect that data was compromised, but to be sure, the university would be covering the cost of an of, of a ID theft uh, platform. So that was the event, so forth. Lots and lots, so what the question is, what has happened since then to make sure that either my data is not compromised or that this never happens again? I can tell you that we've been digging deep. Uh, you do not know what you do not know, and I will tell you that in the first two and a half years, I didn't spend a lot of time digging deep into our IT uh, security. Didn't think that was my, my job, but I guess it is. Uh, other duties as assigned. So we are looking at all kinds of things from record retention and how long we keep files to uh, these executive memoranda that I'm sure you've all read and memorized. There's like 30 of them. Mem executive memorandum 16 deals with cybersecurity. Uh, I just, you know, it's long, it's clunky. I read the thing, I still don't understand it. So truth be told, we are working with IT, now Heath Mello. We're working with um, uh, Bruce Curran and uh, Leighton Brooks looking at everything from records retention to what it means to be issued a university uh, piece of technology to expectations of what each of us knows when, when we accept that to um, putting crawlers behind the scene to scan. If some of you who've been around know that several years ago there was a big push. In fact, it was the year that Mark Askren came 10 years ago to actually come in and look at servers, where they put software on the servers to actually see if we had sensitive information. Um, there hasn't been anything into that space since, to be honest with you. So we are going to tighten this down. We're gonna do it in a humane way. We're starting with the senior leadership team, uh, where we're making sure password protections, a must. Changing your passwords, a must. Uh, making sure that the, the uh, equipment is encrypted, a must, and then being able to, if somebody's laptop gets swiped, actually, if it ever gets turned on, a remote kill switch that wipes the hard drive. These are practices that are around in other institutions, but they don't exist here. We need to step up our game. We will do this in a way through a partnership. I've made it. It's not going to be an edict from on high. But we do need to be uh, moving from the INR leadership team out to all 1,800 faculty and staff uh, at the universe in, in INR to talk about these things. Ultimately, I think there will be a big uh, penalty that uh, when we get these uh, tools and we have this explained to us, if people choose to then put sensitive information, um, there will be HR ramifications and financial ramifications uh, where the cost of, and they're not cheap, some of these big breaches that you're reading about, um, they're multi-million dollar, hundreds of billions of dollars. Um, it's a big deal. So bottom line is we're taking this seriously and we're gonna ask all of you at some point to help us, but right now, do all the things you know. Uh, if you want sensitive information and you need it for your scholarship or your teaching or your, your job, there's a form you need to fill out, it needs to go all the way to the chancellor, to Ronnie Green's desk, he needs to sign it. If you don't have that letter signed, police yourself, get rid of that information, password protect, encrypt, and uh, think about putting that software on that allows our IT team to, uh, to swipe. It's a very unfortunate uh, situation. Um, I apologize, I will own it. I apologize to anyone uh, who was impacted and uh, 
I won't talk about the HR actions that are in, in play, but know that they're in play, okay? Are there plans to renovate Plant Science Hall? No. <laughs> That's probably not the most satisfying answer. There are two significant ways that we invest our financial resources. One is in people. When I was talking about the new hires, I could point out to you that we now have a tenure line faculty of about 330 faculty members. That's up 65 from what it was in 2012. That's about 47% of the total faculty are new hires since 2012. The other place is in facilities, and Barry's sitting over here with Dan. We, the three of us, work together in all of our physical facilities to keep them where they are renovated piecemeal, in most cases, to a level that, that they meet the needs of the occupants of the building. And I might point out in Plant Sciences Hall, uh, on the fourth floor in plant pathology area, there's been quite a bit of work over the past few years upgrading the growth chambers in that area to make them much more function, functional and usable. More recently, we've been working with Martha Mamo in agronomy and horticulture to move three of our newer soil science faculty into a large lab on the lower level of Plant Sciences Hall. So no, we're not going to, we don't have a plan, although I typically point out to people with questions like that because a lot of our new buildings and renovations are from philanthropic donations that if you would like to write the check, any one of you, we, we would be very happy to discuss renovation of Plant Sciences Hall. In the meantime, we will work very hard to make sure that it is kept up in a way that makes it a very functional facility. On that note, Craig Bisher's in the audience, and I suppose he'll be at the back of the door looking for a check for, for renovations. Uh, last two questions. Uh, why was charcoal grilling banned on campus? Yeah, that's a fun. I didn't know charcoal grilling was banned on campus. So uh, we went into investigation mode. And effective July 1st, 2019, there is a new policy on, on campus. We will give you the link so that you can take a look. And uh, sure enough, there is a whole section on grill outs. Groups wanting to grill out may only serve, tasty, pre-cooked hamburgers or pre-cooked hot dogs using a propane gas grill. Any other grilled food or charcoal grills are not allowed. All other food items need to be provided by a University of Nebraska-Lincoln contracted caterer or an approved provider. That's the policy. So I sent Bill a note. Bill Nunez thought I was crazy. <laughs> Hi, Mike. The genesis of this was a Lancaster County health inspector violation for the Union International Food Day and Sales turned out to be sanitary issues, food handling issues, and a wide temperature, a wide variation in temperature. It was, this policy was crafted and vetted in 2018 and finalized in, this is editorialized, in uh, pure academic um, bureaucratic fashion uh, this summer. So it took us a year to fix the grilling uh, charcoal ban on campus. Uh, this was added to the policy by the unions. The fire marshal indicated that we need to eliminate charcoal due to the fact that it can reignite when it's dumped out. This has happened before on campus when trash cans catch on fire, period. We are silent on tailgating, period. <laughs> so one of the tricky things about your questions is we don't have a lot of context. <laughs> So that's what I heard, and that's what we'll put in there. I think the bottom line for me, this was a safety issue, and uh, it was a policy that was put in place to try to keep people safe. 
Um, I think the bottom line is that uh, you'll, if, you're, if you're interested in doing that, there's always an opportunity. So I'm thinking about um, block and bridle, or I'm thinking about uh, some of our groups. I think we can um, work that in, but it just needs a little forth forethought. So that's that. The last one, would it be possible to hold an event or farmer's market on East Campus to showcase, showcase the great offerings and expertise we have? The answer is absolutely yes, no question. In fact, uh, we've been talking with a lot of different groups about how perhaps once a month um, so that we don't compete with anyone, but uh, I'm thinking we ought to close down the main mall once a month food trucks, farmer's market, music, and uh, we are the place that thinks about the production of food, fuel, feed, and fiber, being mindful of the resilience of our soils, our water, and our air, and the people that produce that, that food. Why don't we have this, and how can we be a better partner in the neighborhood? So uh, I think this is a great idea. I know many of us have this idea. Uh, I also think as uh, we talk about the renovations over on the mall, um, not the mall, the, uh, the green space between the Union and the library and Philly Hall that um, you know, we're talking about creating an outdoor amphitheater where there could be music and a splash pad for kiddos at the ice cream store. There's a lot of cool things we should be and could be. So uh, stand by, we'll probably pull a small group together to think about what does this actually look like. So thanks for your questions. And um, with that, I'll uh, turn, ask uh, both Jenny Keshwani, uh, I guess Jenny, to come up and uh, talk to us a little bit about where we're going on this initiative out of the IANR Liaison Committee. Perfect. Thanks, Mike. Um, welcome, everyone. Good morning. Um, so I'm here on behalf of the IANR, IANR Liaison Committee Faculty Liaison Group. Um, and we are talking about proposed revisions to the institute bylaws to include a promotion and tenure committee institute wide. Um, if that sounds familiar, it should, because we did this already in February. Um, there was a vote that came out, um, and these are the results of that vote. Um, if you have not heard, it did not pass. However, it was very close. Um, so according to our bylaws, we need two thirds of those who choose to vote um, to approve a measure moving forward. We had just under that, I believe it was 10 votes shy of passing. Um, so after we received this vote, the liaison committee got together with Rich and we sat down and looked at these numbers and said, well, what do we do now? Um, originally we had thought it was gonna be pretty clear cut whether or not this was going to pass or not. And this was a little bit confusing to us because over half of the people that chose to vote we're in favor of some kind of change. Um, however, it wasn't quite enough to make that change. Um, so we did have an opportunity for you to leave comments when you voted. So we started digging through those and found a few themes that we felt that we were capable of addressing. Um, so we thought, well, let's try this again, see if we can get those 10 more votes um, by addressing a few of these um, concerns that people had related to, related to the vote. Um, so the number one concern people had was that they just had no idea this was a thing. Um, so this was common, I guess, in institutions as large as we are. Um, there were lots of emails, there were forms, there were different ways to get the message out, but people are busy. It sometimes just slips through the cracks and you didn't even see it happen. Um, so this time around, we are making sure that you're all aware of it. So for example, I'm here talking to you all about the, the, propose, uh, the proposed changes. Um, we've been visiting your faculty meetings. Um, we've had a few faculty forums. We have a website. If you go to the INR webpage, um, right on the homepage, there's a link to the proposed changes where you can look at the documents. Um, there's the actual copy of the bylaw change. Um, there is a supplementary document on guidelines. Um, this is not what you're voting on. This is just operational guidelines, the best guess that we have for how this could maybe potentially function. Um, those operational guidelines would be dependent on the committee itself once it's formed um, to decide how it's going to function. Um, there is also a place on the website where there's frequently asked questions. So things that we've been hearing throughout these different opportunities to share this with you, some questions and how we've decided to answer those, all there for you to look at as well as um, a place to submit additional questions. So you can either do that with your name attached or anonymously, two options way at the bottom as well as a timeline. I'll go over the timeline here too, just so you kind of have an idea of where we could potentially be heading. Um, so 
that is one of the comments that we're addressing. And I think it's been really helpful for me personally just to have that opportunity to go visit all these different faculty meetings um, to really understand why we're doing this. Um, originally, we thought the, the main reasons for doing the institute-wide committee um, was the idea of shared governance, right? We're faculty um, at this point um, after the promotion and tech Promotion and tenure packet leaves um, the faculty unit level committee. Um, it goes to the unit head, and then after that point, it's always in administrative hands. Um, so we wanted to have just another opportunity for faculty to have input on the, the packet. Um, so the idea of shared governance, as well as kind of this double voting idea that is currently the, the situation that we have where the cognizant dean um, then makes a decision on a promotion and tenure file. Um, and then it goes to the Council of Deans, where the cognizant dean is also participating. So it's kind of this double vote that um, one dean would, would get on a packet. Um, so those are the main reasons that we started this process. Um, but now that I've been visiting different faculty meetings, I think it's more so that we get a better understanding of what everybody else is up to. I mean, it's been really um, informative for me to sit in on your faculty meetings and just see what it's like to be in a different unit, um, how things run, and to have this institute-wide promotion and tenure um, committee would allow us to see the promotion and tenure process everybody else is going through um, and get a better view of that and how we can maybe streamline things, maybe some department's doing something really well. Why not share that information with, with the other faculty? So. Um, I've been finding this very interesting. Um, so that was one of the concerns. You just didn't know about it. Um, another concern was in our original plan, um, we had 20% um, was the required um, percentage and apportionment to serve in a certain capacity on the committee. Um, so if you had a 20% um, Kazaner appointment, you could be the primary reviewer for a packet coming through with a teaching uh, majority appointment. As you know, if you have a 20% teaching appointment versus an 80% teaching appointment, life looks a little bit different. Um, and your view of that packet might be a little bit different. And so that's something that a lot of people had concerns about, that maybe 20% wasn't quite enough. Um, so in this new version, we've upped that to 40%. So in order to serve as a primary reviewer for a file, um, you would have to have at least 40% in that area um, to serve in that capacity. Um, so a third um, concern people had um, was the fact that we only have nine members on this committee as opposed to 15 to represent every single unit. Um, so this idea of every unit um, having a representative was something that we talked about quite a bit and what would be the appropriate number um, to have on this committee. We ended up with nine. Um, nine is an odd number, which for voting purposes made a lot of sense. Um, it is also divisible by three, which is really helpful because if we have teaching, extension, and research all um, represented on the committee, we want to have equal representation, so three for each area. But why not 15? Also odd and divisible by three. Um, so we're doing really hard math today. Um, so we chose nine because we didn't want to have each unit represented because um, we felt that placed an undue burden on some of the smaller units. Um, th some units might be so small that they only have a couple of individuals that are able to serve on this committee. Um, we didn't think that was fair that those individuals had to continually serve. Um, as well as the fact that we didn't want the idea that you need an, an advocate on this committee um, in order to successfully be approved by them. Um, in fact, if you are coming up from a unit, that member that's representing your unit, um, if there is a member representing your unit on the committee, would be um, asked to not vote and participate in that way simply because we don't want um, a persuasive advocate to have too much say um, in the vote, in the decision, in the discussion, as well as somebody is unfortunate enough to have an advocate that just isn't um, interested in advocating for them. Um, maybe they're not eloquent, maybe they um, just don't choose to particip participate that way. Uh, we didn't want that to have an, an unfair disadvantage to a candidate, so to have um, as much fairness in the process as we could um, make possible. Um, so another, I'm trying to remember all of them, Rich. Workload. workload, that's right. So workload was a big um, concern. If you are one of the fortunate people serving on this committee, it's going to be a lot of work. Um, as you know, serving on a, in a unit um, level promotion and tenure committee, I see several of you out there, it's a lot of work to, re to review these files. Um, and it, it should be in one sense. I mean, when we think about the important things we do as a faculty, who we hire and who we promote in tenure, um, 
probably some of the biggest decisions that we make. Um, so in the operational guidelines, we've tried to streamline the process a little bit just to get a better feel for how this could look um, for people that are serving on that committee. Um, in a typical year, we have around 30 files that go up for promotion and tenure from the Institute. Um, the high, I believe, is 37 or so. Um, of course, recently there's been some peaks with the, the phase one, phase two hires um, getting to that point in the process. Um, so in order to um, streamline that, kind of using a, a, a model from grant proposal reviews. Um, so if you have served on a review panel, oftentimes there's primary and secondary reviewers. Um, so each file that moves forward through this committee would have a primary reviewer that represents their um, apportionment, so teaching and, and research or whatever an individual, individual's apportionment would be, um, would take the deepest dive into the file and then after the rest of the committee members would be more in a secondary, um, where would they be um, required to, to understand the file and look through things, but not as deep of a dive as those primary reviewers. Um, to help spread the load out um, of those 30-some files going through nine um, committee members. Non-tenure, I knew I was forgetting a big one. Thank you, Rich. Um, so one of the other concerns that we heard from um, the respondents was that there are no non-tenure track or professors of practice um, roles on the committee as it currently st stood in the initial proposal. Um, so we have changed that so that now it is um, possible for a non-tenure track professor of practice line to serve on the committee. So nine members, six of those would be fully promoted tenure track faculty, tenure track faculty at that point. Um, the remaining three slots would be open. Um, so they could be for associate level professors with tenure track, uh, with tenure. Um, they could be professors of practice. They could be non-tenure track um, extension professors, things like that. Um, that would really be dependent on the faculty to nominate those individuals to the committee. Um, so individuals would be nominated by the units and then voted on, and if we were fortunate enough to have somebody as a non-tenure track um, line coming through, that would be um, eligible to serve on the committee. Right, that's all, okay, I got them all. Thanks, Rich. Um, so with that, um, what does this look like going forward? Um, so. The vote is coming out to you next Monday. Um, so this coming Monday, it will go live. You'll have about two weeks to vote, um, submit your feedback. Um, so we have comments on there as well, right, Rich? Yes, we'll have comments. So if there's more things you'd like to share with us, that was super helpful, so thank you for doing that. Um, the liaison committee will then look at the votes and make a decision based on how you voted. Um, hopefully it's a little bit more clear cut this time. Um, assuming it passes, um, we will then share this with the Faculty Senate, so it'll start with the Senate Executive Committee, uh, move on to the Faculty Senate where they will um, hopefully choose to ratify um, the changes at the end of the year. Um, the reason this goes to the Faculty Senate is that it involves faculty from multiple institutes and colleges, um, so since we have um, IANR as well as CEHS and the College of Engineering um, faculty, that would be Affected by this change, it would go through um, Faculty Senate. If it passes Faculty Senate, um, we would then start not, uh, submitting or requesting nominations for committee members this um, January. Um, voting would happen early spring, and then the committee would be fully functioning by the next academic year. So how this looks for an individual going up through the promotion and or tenure process, um, the first two steps would stay the same, so unit p and committee followed by the unit leader. Um, then instead of going to the cognizant dean, it would go to this new institute-wide promotion and tenure um, committee. Potentially, depending on um, units, it might go to other places as well, but um, for most of the people, it would then go on to um, the deans that are relevant to that individual, so if you have a teaching and um, extension appointment, it would go to teaching um, and research deans, and then it would move on to the vice chancellor. So the timeline for materials changes a little bit just to accommodate um, this, this system. So materials would now be due November 15th, um, which has been really interesting because this is a 
big discrepancy between units and when these materials are due. I know in biological systems we are due in May, I believe, so this is quite a bit different um, depending on your unit. Um, and then you would have this time for um, the institute-wide um, promotion and tenure committee members to review and provide their decision. Um, and then, of course, there's always opportunity for grievances to be filed if the, the candidate is not satisfied with the results of that review. So I'd be happy to take any questions or comments at this point. I know a lot of you have already heard us talk at your faculty meetings, so maybe we've gotten some of the questions out. Cool, well thank you everyone. And again, go to the website if you have more questions that you just didn't want to share with the group and we'd be happy to address those. Thanks, Jenny. Thank you. Yeah, I would just uh, hats off to the IANR liaison committee for all of the work on this. Uh, this is how it's supposed to work in a shared governance uh, model. And uh, I really appreciate all the time. And uh, I sat in on one of the open fora, and it was uh, really positive to hear. The other thing I would say is that um, you know, we're a community, and I think as a community, as a member of this amazing group, we pride ourselves on being innovators and moving, moving things along. We also pride ourselves on um, treating each other with dignity and respect. And so um, as we go through this process, there may be strong differences of opinion. There may be, um, I'm certain we're not all cookie cutter, and I would just you know, remind everybody to breathe deep and and uh, it's okay to have differences of opinion. It's how we treat each other that's really key. And I would just say at IENR, we have a hallmark of treating each other with respect, um, especially when we uh, differ. And uh, that difference with dignity is really critical. So I would just say this uh, over and over uh, and over again. Every day we make difference in the lives of people here in Nebraska and around the world. There is no question in my mind, and I, I tell people all the time, I think I have the coolest job uh, because I get, to, I get to tell your story, essentially. I want to uh, start by celebrating. Last April, we had our uh, uh, annual event where we recognized our individuals who were promoted and or uh, tenured. And I would just like to say congratulations. Uh, would you stand if you were recognized last April as being promoted or uh, tenured? Please, so we can give you a big round of applause. There we go. This is a big deal for us last year. It was fun for me. Uh, it was a rainy day, but I grabbed, for on, on this campus, I grabbed all of the letters and I walked around to everyone's office and I hand delivered the letters if they were there. And it was so much fun um, to, to say hi and colleagues would come out of their offices, Angie, and we'd have a little bit of a high five session. And, it was really, uh, really pretty powerful. I also want to uh, ask um, any of our colleagues, this place is amazing and it's again because of our people. We have had so many people nationally and internationally recognized um, this past year and uh, this is no different than years past, but if you're on, on this list, would you stand so we could uh, say congratulations? Please, Angie, I know is in the room because I just call her. Joe's here. Yep. Congratulations. I want to say a special note to the faculty again and to the department leaders, uh, unit leaders, school directors. Um, our folks will never get recognized if we don't have faculty and leaders who are willing to take the time to write the nomination package and get them in there. So. Thanks for your help. And then the next two slides, I want to say welcome. Welcome to our newest uh, colleagues. Um, we were very fortunate that, uh, oops, 
So these are our new, uh, new faculty since January's All Hands meeting. So you heard Ron talk about um, constantly hiring new colleagues. This is a big deal. If you're, if you're a new faculty member to our community, would you mind standing up? I know there are several of you in here. Please stand up so we can say welcome. Thank you. Congratulations. Congratulations. And I can't, Paul, I can't see behind you and Bert, so uh, you let me know. Uh, it's a big deal uh, every year in the, in the fall. We have uh, called the Road Scholar, INR Road Scholar Tour, and we typically have between 25 and 35 new faculty and staff, uh, new leaders, and we go out to Scott's Bluff in the Panhandle. We take a different route every year, but it is so much fun um, to get to know our new colleagues at the beginning of their journey. And, Likewise, we have new leaders, or we have uh, colleagues who have stepped into some leadership roles. Craig Allen is no stranger to us. Craig ran our co-op unit as a federal employee. Craig retired from federal service and is now a professor here, and Craig is uh, working with a group of faculty to launch um, a center or an institute around um, resilient working agricultural landscapes. Uh, it's a big deal for us, and we have expertise there. Matt Andrews, Matt, I, I know Matt's here. Matt is coming from Oregon State University. Matt works on 13-line ground squirrels and hibernation of those ground squirrels. It's crazy, that little ground squirrel heart pumps about 350 beats per minute until it hibernates, and it's like two per minute. Imagine what deep space travel could be. Imagine if you were in rural Nebraska and in a car accident and someone was able to administer something that allowed you to go into pseudo-hibernation mode so that you could get to that life-saving treatment center and everything in between. Matt, welcome. Matt is our new EPSCOR director. The new EPSCOR office, this is a big deal for IANR because the former EPSCOR director has always been in the College of Engineering, and while I love our, our colleagues, colleagues in engineering, I'm really glad to have a biologist at the helm, but we put the, the new office on the fourth floor of the Food Innovation Center, and the EPSCOR offices uh, will be there, um, and so I encourage you to go visit. Mark Balschweit, no uh, stranger to us in his department head role, but I've asked Mark, and he agreed as of July 1st to be the interim executive director of the Rural Futures Institute. Uh, Bruce Broderson is our new director of the Vet Diagnostic Center. Kelly Bruns, director at West Central. Uh, Kelly with Ron Rosati announcing his retirement and transition. Kelly has stood up to also serve as the interim director so that you already know we're doing a national search for the next dean of NCTA. Uh, we want to find the best person to lead and I so appreciate Kelly stepping into that role and of course with Kelly stepping into that role, um, Jerry Valeski at Panhandle, or sorry, West Central has stepped into an interim associate uh, director role to help move things along. Sherry Jones, you've already met. We're so excited, Sherry, um, that you have uh, assumed the helm. You are too. Stan Garbett, Stan is uh, here. Stan is next to his partner, Mary, uh, who's no stranger. Stan worked for almost 44 years, I think, is the number with the department, Nebraska Department of Agriculture and uh, almost single-handedly is responsible for introducing Nebraska beef into um, parts of Asia, including Japan, where Nebraska beef, uh, they're the number one importers of our beef product. He has a broad knowledge and is helping us out on an interim basis. Uh, we will be launching a national search for the new director of INR Global. And um, Nicole Smith, help me with her last name. Ferrix. Nicole here. Nicole's not here. Nicole finished her PhD and has uh, just been such a key asset in the college office that we were able to elevate her to a permanent role as assistant dean for student success. Uh, so would you please uh, give this group a round of applause. Thank you very much. I already, I already called Matt out. We need a, Matt, you need a picture where you're smiling. <laughs> We'll grab SNR. I don't know what that means when you're not smiling in S score, but you're smiling big with SNR. So, yeah, Ron already talked about plant science and our, our plans not to be actively uh, 
renovating that, but I do want to say that we moved in. You've heard me talk about the Christians, Christensen addition at NREC. We've moved in. It is amazing. Uh, if you're up in that neighborhood, we were on top of each other. Uh, in labs became offices, and so this was a big deal, and we're excited that uh, this addition is, is there. The dairy store, somebody said, you're doing what? Yeah, that was brand new. You're doing, you're moving the dairy store, what? It's 101 years old. Uh, dairy store is going to move. It's moved in that building multiple times. This is the latest move. Some of, some of you might remember the door, like when you're facing Holdridge or facing the building from Holdridge, there's the door with the, the patio seating. That used to be the front door. And then now the front door's kind of shifted a little bit. Um, the old pilot plant, the one that we picked up before I got here and moved over to the Food Innovation Center, the Food Processing Center, um, that was being used for storage. Uh, also, uh, I don't think I'm probably alone. That building is a little tricky if you want to use the restroom. Uh, there's the, the private one, one stool restroom or you go downstairs. Um, we are putting in brand new state-of-the-art ADA accessible bathrooms, which really opens up our ability to use that whole first floor. So where's the dairy store going? The dairy store is going on the, um, what I'm referring to, the meadow. The meadow, the green space. I think technically we're calling it the meadow at Legacy Plaza because it's technically the Legacy Plaza. It sounds like a baseball stadium. Um, but the meadow area, um, if you've been paying close attention, you know that we blew out the windows and put in some bigger windows so that you could see in and see out so it's not so mysterious. Uh, the soft opening goes next Wednesday and then we'll have a grand opening, but it will be, uh, I'm pretty sure, knock on wood, the nicest dairy store we've ever had. And uh, last year, the Nebraska INR East Campus Dairy Store was the number one passport stop on the Department of Economic Development's uh, statewide passport program. And uh, what a wonderful opportunity to bring people to campus and then from our campus connect. So uh, that's pretty exciting. You can see some of the pictures. Really cool, we retain the old food processing floor, which is really neat. Um, I, I've been kind of grinding on uh, Barry a little bit. We do a lot of scarlet and gray around here. I'm just saying, scarlet and cream, right? I don't want to eat scarlet and gray ice cream, but our color scheme from Devaney to the chancellor's office to the dairy store is a little heavy on the gray. I think we need to adjust it. My, my own two cents as a convert. A convert. East Campus Union, wow. Uh, I wanna say thank you to all of you, and I want to say, especially those of you who work with our students, they have been troopers through this. Um, the idea was that that building would not close, and it has not closed. We're, we're occupying it during construction. And those of you who have meetings on the third floor know what I'm talking about. It's tricky. The idea was that the uh, dining hall the food uh, would be moved from the second floor to the first floor, and that would have been open for the beginning of classes. We didn't hit that target. Um, these are some tentative, and I put them in bold, screaming, tentative dates. Uh, November 4th uh, is the target for the dining center. I've been taking uh, sneak tours. It, it, will, it will rival, um, uh, the uh, dining facilities that just were opened on, on the city campus. The other cool part of this is that old restrictive bit. You had to have a meal plan to go in. It'll be a la carte for breakfast and lunch, and uh, that will allow faculty, students, and staff from all over campus to come and engage. Really positive. Second floor, um, this is the second floor uh, right here by the ladder. Uh, that was all, that was where you walk down to the front doors. So we've normalized the second floor floor plate. Uh, a lot of concrete got cut out. Um, they're working on, there will be a Starbucks for those of you who like Starbucks. So we have scooters, we have Cultiva, we have Starbucks. 
I'm hoping for a Dunkin' Donuts in, uh, in the CYT. I don't know if I'll get my wish, but uh, you've got, and for now, until the dining hall's open, you have free coffee from dining services um, right there and a grab and go. Um, the bowling alley, you can see, this is an athletics project and uh, uh, spoiler alert, you're going to hear on, on Friday a potential big uh, announcement about some massive changes to our athletics complexes um, on the city campus and beyond. And you should hear that on Friday. And if you haven't heard, game day's coming to town. And so uh, thankfully it won't touch our parking, but uh, parking there in the Memorial uh, Stadium lot is going to uh, be a little tense uh, for the next couple of days. So this is going like gangbusters, pretty exciting. CYT, I know it doesn't look like a lot's going on in CYT, but uh, CYT has been completely gutted. And um, CYT uh, went through its abatement and they are working um, on things, uh, mechanicals and so forth. This is going to be every bit of Love Library North, Adele Commons, when we're, when we're done. So when you think about the union, when you think about the new Massengale Living uh, Center, when we think about CYT, when we think about um, the first floor of, uh, it's technically, I think, the Food Innovation Building. I think we're probably just need to, Ron, call the whole thing Philly Hall and be done with it um, because it's a little confusing. But uh, there's a lot of going on. Um, and then to add to it, over at the um, Life Science Annex, I guess that would just be to the east of the existing Life Science Annex, to the north of the Virology Center. Uh, we are putting a $5 million addition to the Life Science Annex that allows us to do uh, more work with germ-free uh, animals. Um, this new addition is uh, really going to be dedicated to the Food for Health um, Center that Andy Benson is leading. Uh, really cool work uh, on this one where you know they're busy looking at the human gut microbiome, uh, the microbes that line our digestive tract, they're isolating those microbial communities, not just one, one species at a time, but the whole community. They actually grow them in laboratory test tubes and they've been busy feeding them uh, plant-based materials and looking at how the microflora breaks down the plant uh, products and then looking at the metabolites that are being released from that plant material to actually look at uh, chronic digestive diseases such as Crohn's, but also looking at cognition. Cognition, I keep working on it quick, Andy, I'm going to need it here. Cognition for those of us getting a little senior, but also looking at cognition and memory in young children and how that's tied back to some of the nutrition, but also heart health and diabetes. Um, this is the new wave and the new generation, and in order to do this, once they find the right mix of the bacteria or the community, um, the probiotics, I think I've got that right, and then the prebiotics, which are the, the plant-based materials, what they do is they take germ-free mice and they humanize, quote unquote, the mice, where they actually insert into these uh, germ-free mice, they insert the microbiome. And then they can feed the microbiome, the, uh, the prebiotic, and actually see if they get the health outcomes. So it's really cool, and uh, this is a $5 million. So when you add this all up, to, to our point, just in my limited time here, we had Burn Fetty, we celebrated in 2017, Burn Fetty go away. Burn Fetty had roughly 155, uh, could hold 155 students. We still have love. Um, residence hall. The new Massengale's at 374 students. So we've more than doubled our footprint for students on campus. We've moved our students to the center of campus where the biochemistry building used to be. Really pretty amazing. That allowed us to then think about outdoor recreation. So that's really cool um, uh, on campus. Then we've got East Campus Union, which hasn't seen a lot of love since 1974. <laughs> And uh, C.Y. Thompson, who hasn't seen much love since 68, give or take. Um, just to put some numbers on this, uh, that's a $28.5 million renovation on the East Campus Union. It's a $22.5 million completely philanthropy-based addition at CYT. 
And then um, you've got the work going on in Philly. You have this, we're in the process. Sherry's leading the charge on uh, Ruth Staples Early Childhood Development Center and also our uh, family and marriage therapy um, that happens in those circa World War II barrack-like things. Uh, our old home economic labs, which give me the eebie-jeebies every time I walk by them. Um, it's just kind of throwaway. $14 million uh, new institute or new center that's going to go over by Barclay. And that I love because back to our neighborhood conversation, it sits just opposed to the smoker reading lab, which is fantastic, the dental college clinic, and the civil clinic in the law college. So as we think about engaging the neighborhoods here in Lincoln and thinking about this wickedly complex neighborhood that we live in, um, this is just really a neat way to be relevant in the lives of the people that are nearest. And, Honest to goodness, if we can't do that here in Lincoln, what makes us think we can go to Tanzania and put center pivots in? And what makes us think we can go around the world and, and have impact, right? We have to do it here and walk the talk. And then just a little bit, uh, not, to, not to forget the Nebraska Innovation Campus. There's a lot of neat things. You heard me already talk about um, the EPSCOR office going in there. We are what I would say in um, IENR's footprint out there, version 2.0. The first version was to get, uh, get tenants out there. The second version is to get the tenants that align with the programs that advance our teaching and learning, our discovery, innovation, creative works, and that allow for us to engage Nebraska and beyond. And that's happening right now. Uh, for example, ConAgra was an anchor tenant out there when ConAgra's uh, C-suite left Omaha and went to Chicago. The partnership changed. Uh, right now, our, our partner out there is uh, the parent company of Henningsen Foods. It's called QP. Uh, their claim to fame is mayonnaise and salad dressing in Japan. They're a $5 billion food company, and just in the last 18 months, they've driven in a, a quarter of a million dollars of research for our food scientists, so it's been very positive. Um, but this big thing here that don't let the name worry you, 72 Hotel, we can call it whatever we want, but this is a public-private partnership between the Innovation Campus and Marriott Hotels. They will be putting a five-star hotel similar to something like the Nittany Lion Inn or the Blackwell or Auburn's uh, this will be an iconic place for people to come, but more importantly, our HRTM, I always get those, uh, HRTM, our Hospitality Restaurant and Tourism Ma Management Program, that program will use this as a living learning laboratory. And uh, this has been approved by the city and is going forward to the, the board. Uh, the Charlie Hedstrom, I just met Charlie last week. Charlie is a new hire by the management company called Tetrad. Uh, this is an important hire for us because uh, Charlie's job is to help us uh, make connections with uh, companies that can amplify what we're doing. It's very important, so we're, I'm excited he's here. Well, okay, INR equals momentum, resilience, and innovation. Uh, this is, these are the words I think about. I want to thank you too, and I really mean this, I'll slow down, thank you. Thank you for not letting the challenges that we have faced, and they have been numerous and intense the last two years, especially around the budget, get in the way of the good work that each of you, your programs, your centers, your, that you do. I've said this over and over and over, and you have stepped up to uh, wrestle with what does this mean and not get distracted. Do not let the noise get in the way. Keep your feet moving. We are doing incredible things here. And I'll just say a big shout out to all of our uh, extension uh, faculty and staff. This has been an incredibly difficult year. I think it was the wettest year in July uh, in history, in recorded history. From the bomb cyclone hitting the panhandle just at the time calving was starting for many people to how that led to six inches of rain being dumped on many parts of the, the eastern part, especially uh, the Niobrara and, and Spencer. And 
the rupturing of the dam and the flooding over and over, um, you know, 250 year flood in 2011 that impacted the Missouri and a 500 year flood in 2019. Chuck Hibbard's like, um, something's going on and it's probably a matter of if not when the next, uh, when not if the next uh, event happens. We still have communities uh, um, like Peru that don't have their water systems up and running um, big time. So if that wasn't bad enough, then we had more rain in July, uh, unprecedented flooding in Buffalo County and Kearney in particular. Uh, we had the collapse of a 102 year old irrigation tunnel uh, as part of the Goshen Gearing Irrigation uh, Canal that supplies some 105,000 acres of irrigated ground um, in uh, both Wyoming and Nebraska get hit. That went down on the 16th or 17th of July and we didn't get water flowing for another 35 days. Um, for not the efforts of Nebraska Extension, and in particular those located in the Panhandle, I'm not so sure that the federal government would have considered that um, to be covered by crop insurance. People's lives have been impacted and, and every time along the way, Extension has been there. And so um, let's give Extension uh, a big round of applause today. So I'd like to talk a little bit here um, it, toward the end. Uh, I want to talk back to Tiffany's point. Um, a huge congratulations to Sue Ellen and that team, our team in Kasner. But as Tiffany said, and this is, this is amazing, if you go back 15 years, 14 years, back to the early 2000s, uh, Kasner, Kasner's enrollment, graduate and undergraduate, was sitting around 1,500 students. Today, 3,200 students. So a 14 year journey doubling the size of the college. 15 straight years of increased enrollments in Kastner. Find another college at UNL, find another ag college across this country that can say that you won't find one. And as Tiffany said, um, and to give her kudos, it, it takes leadership but it takes a team and it takes a village, and we have been fortunate in that way. You've read the newspapers like I've read the newspapers, and while this is a, a really good feel-good story here, here's the other part that I, I want you to know we're, we're wrestling with. UNL is like floating in a, in a boat. Uh, we're all in the same boat. While we can take great pride about uh, Kasner and, and its uh, enrollment trends, we need every college at UNL to be hitting on all those cylinders because if one or two of those colleges, our partner colleges, aren't hitting the mark, we might be able to collectively take care of business. But when you have six colleges that literally are taking on water because of enrollments going the wrong way, it's very difficult for the three that are seeing increases. And the three that are seeing increases are being led by Kasner the Journalism and Communications College of JCOM and the Law College. Those are the three. And the other colleges this year are actually in trouble. In fairness, business was in the positive ledger in 2019 with JCOM and Kasner, but we've seen some flipping in that space. This is a big deal and we're all in this together. There's just no way around it. So to think about what's going on, Enrollment slips at three of the four main schools at the University of Nebraska system. This was in Omaha World Herald. The one where it didn't slip this year was UNMC. So our professional health science programs. The other three campuses also decreases. Last year, Ronnie Green at a State of the University address talked about how UNL was down 1% last year, 1%. So we hit a 26,000 high point, now we're around 25,400. This year we thought we'd be down another percent. Worst case scenario, we thought we'd be down 2%. And again, to my point, doesn't matter if the system, if the university's down 2%, the boat's getting lower in the water, okay? Sorry, a Navy guy, that's a bad thing, all right? 
And then when you take a look at a number, this isn't, as Tiffany said, this is just not something happening here in, in Nebraska. It's happening all over the country. And uh, when you take a look at this, uh, this is a national uh, phenomenon. If you think about the demographics, our population is uh, aging. If we think about traditional college age students, the numbers are getting smaller. And there's fierce competition going on for those students. And so that's kind of the mix. I think the number that I would feel comfortable sharing with you is that over the next five to 10 years, we expect a decrease of 5% in the traditional college age student population, which goes exactly right back to the work that's happening in your unit. So those of you who are curriculum committee chairs, those of you who are involved with recruiting and retaining our students, those of you that are thinking about our, our strengths and how we build strength on strength, it's going to be absolutely critical that we are the place of choice in Nebraska for students interested in the production of food, fuel, feed, and fiber, the resilience of our natural ecosystems, the harmonization of those two that I believe we truly do better than any other school in America, and then thinking about the vitality and prosperity of rural people here in Nebraska and beyond. We have to build on those strengths and the departments are working in that space. I share this with you because behind the scenes, we're spending a lot of time, in fact, this morning was not really how I wanted to spend my morning. And I spent an hour and a half with Ronnie and Richard Moberly and Bill Nunez and Mike Zeleny just talking about the, the financial realities of what these 1.4% uh, dip in enrollments two years in a row, what that means. It's a big number and, and we have to fill it somehow. And we can't just keep taking cash and using cash reserves to fill it with hope. So we are working very hard, know that. That's all I wanna say about this. It's real, know that we need to be thinking about this and doing something. One of the areas that we need to do a better job is the mobilization of scholarship dollars that are embedded primarily out in the units. We have, uh, we have a habit in Nebraska of remitting uh, a lot of tuition, and it's a big number. And when you remit, it's like giving it away for free. It's not generating revenue, and it's simply we're, we're out of balance. But the other place we're out of balance is we need to use the the resources that we have effectively, and so we're gonna be working with the units to try to find those resources. The other side of the coin is we also need to be working with the state, and Susan Fritz on Friday is gonna sit in front of the Appropriations Committee, and she is going to pound the table, the way I think Susan gets it, that we need greater state funding for both Pell-eligible students, as well as students um, in general that are going to build Nebraska and grow Nebraska. And so hopefully we see some kind of a, the governor's office and the legislature with Susan Fritz helping bring them together. We can see something here that'll relieve some of the pressure. So I'm not ringing an alarm bell. Thank goodness. It's the first year I've been here out of three that we haven't had a cut from the state, right? On the first two years, we cut a lot of money, $4.5 million in our base budget and we gave back $6 million in cash. Painful stuff. And we've done that in a way that you have been great about keeping us going forward. So we're gonna to continue to wrestle with this. We we'll keep building strength on strength. Um, just, you know, watch out is what I have to say. I wanna talk a little bit about some uh, exciting initiatives that continue to build on things that happened before I got here. The Beef Systems Initiative started in 2016. Uh, we are, uh, really it was called the Nebraska Integrated Beef Systems Initiative, but somehow we dropped off, Chris, we dropped off the Nebraska Integrated part and we just called it Beef Systems Initiative. We've had a group of individuals, some 74, we have a big powwow on October 4th to really talk about we're the beef state, we're the beef state while others are collapsing around us from Saskatoon, Saskatchewan on the High Plains all the way to Amarillo, Texas. We are the place, we are the go-to place. 
What does that mean? What's that look like? And how do we, how do we elevate that? And how do we do that in partnership with, uh, with others? We've put uh, positions into this space. Uh, we've uh, really looking at this GEMS uh, genotype by environment, by management, by society. Uh, thinking a lot about these big audacious uh, goals. I already talked a little bit about the Center for Resilience and Working Agricultural Landscapes. Uh, get me on my soapbox. We have the Grassland Center, which is amazing, 25 years old. We are blessed with 20,000 square miles of grassland, uh, native prairie, the sand hills. Uh, truth be told, it's one of the largest uh, grasslands in the world. And grasslands don't get the homage that tropical rainforests, but we're losing more grassland per year than we are rainforest per year. So uh, we have something special, and we do integrated production, integrated systems better than anywhere else. And uh, this is an opportunity to think about how we could even do a better job in this space. And then I, I've said it three or four times already, uh, rural communities, um, the RFI, was created and then reinfused with funding in 2011, and at the same time, Extension put a lot of funding and resource into the Community Vitality Initiative. We're in this pivotal spot where um, leadership transitions in both of those entities. So I asked a group of really wickedly smart people from a cross section to think about what have we been doing in rural community development over the last 35 years, and what where should we go and what should it look like in the next 35 years, or at least the next three to five years. They are working together. There are two open fora. I encourage you, if you're passionate in the space, to come and share your thoughts. And then I've asked for a report on the 15th of November that will allow us to think about next steps as we go forward. And then if you're always trying to be normal, you will never know how amazing you can be from Maya Angelou, our poet laureate who passed away. I love this. If you're always trying to be normal, you'll never really know how amazing you can be. And I picked this because I think we are, INR is an amazing, it's unique, it's an amazing platform for making real and positive impacts every day in our local communities, our regional, our national, and then beyond, and uh, it's special because of the people. And so on this note, I don't think uh, can, I think we know that we're making a positive impact. Um, we're not interested in being typical or normal. We're bound, bound pushers, problem solvers, uh, hear that all the time, um, difference makers. All 1,800 of us that have the the opportunity to be here. So I just want to say thanks to you. Uh, thanks for everything you do to move INR forward, uh, but really for making the world a better place. And uh, it, I'm glad to be a part of the team. I want on that note to say that uh, we have picnic uh, outside for the folks here in Lincoln. The senior leadership team will be milling around smartly. I'm going to drop my jacket, put on my SNR hat, and, uh, and I'll be visiting with you. So with that, um, go Big Red.